You're watching Deprogrammed. This is the new Culture Forum show devoted to fighting back against the forces of ideological conformity, particularly among the young. My name's Harrison Pitt. I'm a senior editor at the European Conservative, and I'm thrilled to be joined today, as ever, by Evan Riggs, who is a freelance journalist, and our special guest this week, Tom Jones, a Tory councillor for Scotland and Lower Wensleydale, and the man behind the Potemkin Village Idiot Substack. Now, um, uh, Tom, Michael Gove has wheeled out a, a new definition of extremism. Um, he says that it's extremism, he defines extremism in terms of any ideology based on violence, few can object to that. But then he adds hatred and tolerance, which seem highly contentious and uh, subjective terms. Are you worried about what this um, may mean under a Labour, a Labour government, which is in all likelihood what we're what we're going to be heading for? Yeah, I think I think we should all be be worried about that. I think uh, the wording of it um, makes it quite clear that things like um, abortion restriction would be included in this, which I think I think is a real problem. Mm. Um, no matter what you think of our abortion laws, we cannot. We cannot call those people extremists. Mm -hmm. um, but I think handing that much power to criminalise sometimes quite mainstream thought, I think is going to be a real problem. And I'm really not sure why we're doing it mm. when we are heading into a Labour government that actually we don't know do you, how long is going to last. Do you think this is like a f clever 4D chess move to prevent the Tories from being outflanked on the right? So it actually prevents a replacement party from coming up against them because they can just say actually you're too extreme we've now we've now outlawed you we're this sensible center that's that's real dissident thinking mm. um i mean it, it is possible i think keir starmer is probably going to criminalize right-wing politics anyway <laughs> so more than they already are yeah i think um i think keir starmer his governing strategy is going to be really interesting because of his background as director of public, public prosecution. prosecutions i think there's going to be quite a lot of um very heavy use of legislation and um, uh, regulation to make things much more difficult for, for the right wing. I actually don't think GB News will be on the air if we get two terms of Labour. Really? I think it'll be off. Yeah. How do you think that would actually pan out in practicality? Just I, off I think, yeah, Ofcom. I think Ofcom will take it off. So they're already in trouble with Ofcom for not having enough regional voices, mm -hmm. which has got them in trouble before. Um, and I think they will, so they're also in trouble for having a presenters on who are government ministers. Um, I think they had quite a few complaints about the, uh, Rishi thing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the town hall he did. Yes. Um, it was, it was, it was, it was in Darlington, wasn't it? In, in, the, in the Northeast. Yeah. Something like that. For yeah. GB news. And he had to take questions from the audience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Unprompted questions. Um, and I think they had quite a lot of complaints about the, um, impartiality of that and I, I do think they'll take GB News off. Yeah well I mean speaking like as a Canadian American immigrant Ofcom is just bizarre to me mm. like the entire thing doesn't make any sense and it, mm. it doesn't make any sense to me either why the the people behind GB News would actually try to make it a an entity that's regulated by Ofcom because they must have known immediately that they were just going to be tripping over it every week which is exactly what's happened. I mean, do you think that there's a potential that GB News just like turns itself from a broadcaster into a YouTube channel or a Substack? <laughs> I don't know about Substack, but I mean, the, the YouTube thing is already happening with Talk TV, right? Mm. So that's already going mm -hmm. onto YouTube, but I, that's not an Ofcom issue. That's a, they can't get anybody to watch it, watch it issue, yeah, yeah. which is slightly in the case, In the case of Talk TV, you mean? In the case of yeah, Talk TV. But it may become an Ofcom kind of issue if um as is likely to be the case like i mean forget the, these particular um conservative channels whether on television terrestrial television or on radio <clears throat> there are plenty of um mainstream channels which are realizing that it's not as profitable to be on terrestrial t television as it was in the past the mm -hmm. advertising revenue has migrated online as most of the media space migrates pretty solidly from being on terrestrial t television to being online it's likely that ofcom will expand its reach and will instead take it upon itself to start regulating internet content. We've already seen the beginnings of this with the online safety bill. Again, another weapon which the Conservative Party appears intent on putting in the hands of its sworn enemies. You're very welcome. <laughs> um, Sorry, Tom. No, it's okay. I, Local uh, councillors uh, are very remote from all of, from all of this decision making, but you know. I think that's right, and I think it will be. I think there will be quite a wide push under a under a Starmer government on misinformation. Mm. 
which um you know you can already see at the bbc which their bbc verify unit um mm-hmm. my friend fred goldthorpe's done quite a lot of work on this it's interesting mm-hmm. the things they pick up as misinformation and who they assign it to um but i think that will be a big focus for a starmer government i think it will i think there will be i th- will there be an ofcom misinformation unit mm-hmm. i mean it's Perfect. It's perfectly, perfectly plausible. plausible. I can see misinformation legislation coming in. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that will be applied a bit like the prevent strategy mm-hmm. um, asymmetrically. Yes, yes. And like, like we'll, like Evan uh, spoke about this on uh, on last week's show about the, this sort of cult of uh, even handedness. Or mm. what did you call it? To both sidesism. Yeah. Mm. Which seems to infect. Well, it's. it's it, it, well, it's like when when Rishi came out and he said, you know, we have a problem with violence coming from uh, Islamists and also the far right mm-hmm. who are trying mm-hmm. to like tear society apart. And it's like, who is the far right? I mean, I guess they had that hope not hate report that just came out today, which is like Jason Jacob Rees Mogg, and I'm assuming all three of us are not <laughs> are not super far right. I'm only like nominally a conservative, um, but. I, it, it seems weird to me that you would have to even make a statement like that, and I and, and I do think that you know if this kind of legislation that you are anticipating does get passed, that both sidesism will go away under Labour. They don't feel the need to really play that game. It's a Tory curse that they've inflicted upon themselves. But what? But what? How? How would you? I mean, what, what do you think explains this apparent? Uh, this, this apparent death wish, like the, the fact that the Conservative Party is not only it, like there, there seems to be a um, there seems to be a, they seem to be incapable of realizing that they have people who they are just never going to bring around to their way of thinking to, to the extent that they hold hold to the, the basics of conservative philosophy, and so, but they constantly seem to be trying to appease this sort of BBC Guardian Easter class rather than trying to satisfy the people who have consistently kept them in office and have expected much better from them. I have got absolutely no idea. <laughs> I don't know why we keep doing we keep doing it. I mean, it, this is the dinner party problem, right? Okay. That like conservative MPs don't want to do things basically that will get them uninvited to mm-hmm. North London dinner parties or any London dinner parties. Yes. Um I think um part of this is to do with the death of mass participation in um political parties. Mm-hmm. So when parties were set up, they were part of, they were an institution of belonging that sat alongside, you know, the Tory party was called, uh, Church, Church of Church England of, uh, was called the Tory party, party of prayer. prayer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got there eventually. Yes. And, um, now they're the neo-Marxist in, in <laughs> committee, but yeah. Yes. Um, and labor, you know, the labor membership was innately tied up with membership of trades unions and working men's clubs as well and working men's clubs. And there were conservative clubs as well, yeah, yeah. you know, that still exist and now have no relation to the conservative party. Indeed, whatsoever. there was there was a whole sort of aspect of social uh, membership that went with that. It, so you, uh, when you went to the meetings, it, I'm, 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 I'm sure that politics came up, but you'd also play darts or you'd play pool or, mm. and, and you'd have a drink and you'd kind of socialize with your there was a kind of there was a very charming neighborliness to it yeah but more than that i think in political terms that gave the political parties essentially a feedback loop Mm -hmm. it put them in contact with ordinary non-political people um who would give them feedback about policies they didn't like you know Mm -hmm. at a local government level that saying you know the new roundabout they've installed isn't very good or it needs cleaning up at the Westminster level, you know, I was talking about particular policies that are coming in or, or you know, how the welfare state is, is actually working on the ground. Yeah. And the problem is that, that that has now eradicated. It's just gone. Um, membership of political parties is not only tiny, it's also really restricted. Do so think- it's, it's just middle class people now. And and I think that basically there is there is a disconnect between between MPs and the government mm. and normal people, because th- that kind of institution that sat underneath it and provided a grounding has just eroded. Do you think it's possible to kind of revivify it? I mean, you're a card carrying local councilman yourself. I mean, you've gotten involved in politics at, at a local level. If there was a young person out there who kind of wanted to sort of stop that erosion or build it back up, would you recommend doing what you've done? Or do you think there's a better way of going about it? I I think, I mean, if you're asking me if I think people should get involved in local politics, young people should get involved in politics, 
absolutely. I have learned so much. Um, I've made loads of loads of friends in the party, actually, um, which for a while was the only thing keeping me in the party. Um, and not only that, I have you know serving in uh, in local government. I have learned you know selfishly. I have learned an amazing amount of stuff. Like what? Uh, like stuff like planning legislation, mm. like, uh, you know, I now have a much better idea of what I would like to do with planning, um, than I did before. Um, you know, you see a lot of problems, um, on the ground, you have you, a lot of stuff about power structures, uh, that I hadn't considered before. Um, in terms of reinstituting party membership, I think, um, I think actually the CDO, the Conservative Democratic Organisation, have some 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 quite good ideas. I'm not a member or anything, but I think they see the lack of input for members as a real problem. And I I actually don't think they go far enough. I think we should get rid of the role of MPs in selecting the Conservative Party leader when we're in opposition and in when we're in power. Um, I think we should hold open primaries actually for MPs should be very helpful yeah. and I think we should make all serving MPs go through open primaries for reselection for reselection re yeah they... so even if you are re-standing in a very very safe conservative seat I think you should have to go I see what you mean but, 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 but it would be local it wouldn't be national no it would be local I see yeah, that makes sense yeah no I I would agree with that and I think this is one of the um uh so there's quite a lot there but I think one of this is one of the reasons why it's been much harder to, to get populism going in the Conservative Party than it has to get it going in the Republican Party. Because in the Conservative Party, mm -hmm. uh, when MPs are sort of putting themselves forward as a potential leader, they first need to hoover up support, not from the base, but from the yeah, parliamentary yes. party. And that there, there, are, there are obvious pressures there in, 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 which, which count against more subversive uh, figures and count uh, and, and which uh, serve, um, stand to benefit much more establishment types. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, the conservatives are probably looking across the Atlantic to the Americans and realizing that if they ever change that, they could just be taken over. That's the problem. I mean, Trump's gotten now nominated three times, despite the fact that the Republicans did it's everything they could to, to, to... Indeed. So it might be a matter of the turkeys voting for Christmas to get it mm. through. I don't know whether this is actually... Th I mean, the CDO may, may have that. Is that one of its... The CDO's proposals. I or? don't. I don't think they've they've gone for open primaries, but yeah. that's one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> but is it the, but the, the likelihood of that having any purchase on the Conservative Party seems remote. Yes, I th at this point. Uh, yeah, I think so. It seems I think so. It, they probably need to be plunged into some kind of uh, like existential crisis, basically, yeah. which is I mean, it's something like being reduced to less than a hundred MPs might do it. Quite <laughs> so, indeed, yes, yeah, mm. be helpful. What I mean. I don't know how much you can actually talk to us about this, but what is sort of from your behind the scenes perch? What is the, the vibe or the tenor inside of the Tories about what's kind of inevitably coming down the pipes for them? So I think I'm part of a, I think I'm part of a generation that all the conservative members that I talk to, or most of them, or the, you know, conservative adjacent people in think tanks, journalists, um, I don't think they're that sad about the Tories losing power. Mm. And they're fearful of, of Keir Starmer um, because, again, of the, of the changes that we think he's going to bring in. But actually, I, I don't think there's that much love lost because I look at this, I think most of us look at, look at the country over the last 14 years. It's less conservative than it was when we came into power, noticeably. Um, and it is not much richer and you know there are i think for 14 years i think we've we've probably given people a pretty poor return on 14 years of conservative government mm. to be honest ed west no, 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 uh, that is honest uh, it's also true and ed, <laughs> and ed, ed west uh, once like brought that point home because it's so easy to get into the weeds of this and then say oh, we did the academic free speech and academic freedom but obviously any government will probably usually accidentally end up doing decent things um but um ed west once put the point very sort of tranchantly when he, he said um someone went into a coma in 2009 and woke up today and was told nothing about what had been happening politically over the last 14 years but was just given a flavor of what life was like in britain it's not in a million years would they suppose that a conservative government or some 
some version of a conservative government, the coalition and obviously the Brexit stuff and all that sort of thing, but some version of a conservative government had been in power for 14 years. Like, they, they, there's no way they could come to that conclusion. They would assume that the, the, the Blairite project had proceeded more or less undisturbed. So that it so, has. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It has. Yeah. There, there, there's, there's fear and there's not, not really a great sadness, but is there any anger? Because I imagine that if somebody woke up from that coma, they would be kind of bewildered and then pissed off. Yeah, there is there is a lot of anger, and actually, I think this is really interesting. So we were talking before the show about um, politics, Joe, and you rolled your eyes obviously because yeah. they're they're very very left wing. Um, <laughs> Snobbery is one of my weaknesses. <laughs> yeah. um, I went on their podcast, and I, you know, I'm quite good friends with them and text them fairly often. And actually, it's really interesting that they are about our age. I'm presuming your age is. I'm not going to ask. Um, they are about our age and actually they, the economic problems for young people, I, I think they see as exactly the same as somebody on the right wing would. would. I, I think there is no longer a, a particularly strong class divide. I think the problem in this country is really one of, of intergenerational disparity. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think that's interesting that, you know, I, as a, you know, somebody to the right of the Conservative Party would agree with Ollie Dugmore from Politics Joe, who, you know, is on Keir Starmer's list for, for being too left wing. <laughs> um, <Okay. laughs> because it's things like, you know, you can't afford a house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, from a left wing perspective, you should be able to own a house. From a right wing perspective, you should be able to own a house. And that's something that, that unites us. And it's, but it, that's an intergenerational thing. Um, it was one of the core, like, they, it, this, this isn't even um, too academic. I mean, th this, this was one of the, like, as conservatism, uh, the Conservative Party in particular, but English conservatism had to wrestle more with the the um, the upheaval, I suppose, or the or the, the dislocations caused by like, mass democracy. Like, there was this, there was this um, renew, that renewed emphasis in the, the late 19th century, early 20th century, but mm -hmm. Churchill's father and Churchill were both part of this. Thatcher picked, picked up this theme as well, of like, we're a property-owning democracy. Yeah. Like you, in order to be an upstanding, yeah. conservative-minded citizen, it, 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 it's not enough just to give, give people Burke and Bolingbroke and expect them to read that and feel conservative. You need to give them a stake in the social order. Yeah. And if you're not doing that, then you shouldn't be, if you're not giving people capital, not giving it to them, if you're not giving them the opportunity to, to acquire assets and capital and to have a stake in the social order to raise a family, like, what, like in what universe are they going to be conservative minded free marketers? Yeah. So, so this, one of the things, there's that old, um, that old line that if you're not, yeah. is it, if you're not conservative by the time you're 50, you don't have a, if you're not oh, socialist by the time you're 20, you don't have a heart. heart yeah. And if you're not conservative by the time you're 40, you don't have a head. That's right. Yeah. That's not because you get to like your mid thirties and start reading Edmund Burke and start thinking, wow, well, do you know, this guy's actually really got some points. <laughs> it's yeah. because as you age, you build up a store of financial and, um, and cultural capital that mm -hmm. gives you a standing, uh, in society mm -hmm. that is worth conserving. Yeah, you have to actually have something to conserve, to be yes. conservative. And and our problem is, the conservatives problem is that we have prevented an entire generation from doing that mm. by focusing on homeowners, not home ownership. Mm, um, yeah, uh, my uh, friend James Vitali has a great line about this, um, about- he, he works at the, um, the, the, what's it called again? Just so people know, he's, he's on Twitter, James Vitali, what's he called? James Vitali. Oh, it's Policy Exchange. He's the yeah, of something. Policy Exchange, policy exchange yeah. yeah. Um, he has a great line um, about two nation Toryism, that basically we have created a two nation Tory state of homeowners and non-homeowners. Mm, yeah. And from a purely political perspective, that's mad because mm -hmm. people who don't own their homes do not vote conservative, right. you know, flatly. And also economic, moral, social squalor that follows from not owning your own home. Right, yes. You know, we, we talk a lot in this, um, on this show about there's, there's been a couple of figures, you know, Peter Hitchens being probably the most prevalent one or prominent one, um, who have said, you know, that young people should just leave the UK. Um, but I do wonder to the degree that, you know, if, if I was an intelligent young British person, I wasn't particularly political and I could go to America and actually like own a home or, or I could go to New Zealand or wherever and, you know, build this kind of life. Like if you're not in it for purely ideological reasons, I do wonder to the degree that the conservative party has pushed out 
mm. its its future mm. has it's not brain drain i don't know what it would it be it's like exile um i think that's right but also i think probably the the primary driver of emigration is is um purely economic so i think i think there is some crazy stat about police officers i think um one in four has applied for it it's not as high as one in four it's about one in seven has applied for a job in australia really because well if you're a policeman why you know look at the way the the police are, are considered by both the right and the left in in britain why would you stay mm. why would you stay or you could go to australia and you know like go and work in a really high trust little village in the middle of nowhere mm. and, and get paid way way more see I, I and made... it's sunny all the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've made this point a few times, which is that if you had an actual conservative government in this country, what I would try to do is I would go to the Kiwis and the Aussies and the Canadians and all the people who are living in, mm -hmm. in blue America and feel like they want a way out and say, come to come to the UK. Mm -hmm. Like just basically, if, if you're going to have like this like mass immigration scheme, why don't you try to pull it from, you know, the former colonies or the Commonwealth? And say like, look, if, if you feel dispossessed in Australia because you're being locked in your homes during COVID and people are flying drones overhead to make sure you're not in your backyard, come here. We'll pay for your plane ticket to come here and, and just hoover up all the talent. And in reality, you're having the exact opposite thing, which is that like for people like us who are political and, and care about this this country, they say, well, I'm going to stay and I'm going to make the best of it because I believe in it. But if, if you're not, if you're just a normal person, I, I probably wouldn't recommend that people come to the UK at this point. Certainly not that they come. I'd try and urge them to remain, but it would be difficult to make the case that they mm. should turn up on our shores. Yeah, I mean, isn't it the case that the manager of a uh, drive-through car wash earns more than the prime minister? Oh yeah, Bucky's. That's yeah, an yeah, yeah, that's an American institution. Yeah, that's it, Bucky's. Yeah, I mean, we are poorer than every U.S. state bar Mississippi, and I think a couple of years ago we were poorer than Mississippi GDP per capita. Sure, and. You know, from an economic perspective, it's you're right. It's really difficult to make that case, and I'm not sure I could. No, indeed. I mean, housing costs are also insanely high in Australia, but you know, you can go and, and get a house, and and at least the wages are well, on, on much much it, much if higher. If you're a truck driver for a mine in Australia, my uncle lives in Australia. You make one hundred seventy five thousand dollars a year That's being a truck driver yeah. for a mine. I mean, you know, it's not most glamorous job but you're fine if you if you just have kids or whatever and you don't care about that stuff yeah yeah and and yeah the the cost of living is higher out there but you're also buying yourself quality of life mm. because like i say it's sunny all the time um and you know it, it, yeah yeah i i think it would be really really difficult to make the case for people to come to the uk did you see and that yeah recent... they keep coming <laughs> you know, no, we're not the types that everyone's talking about no we're having this debate but you know we let in you know immigration was 1.2 million people yeah. over the last two years mm, so yeah, well, you know well it's especially weird for truly me because, people do want to come yeah i mean again I, i'm i'm not a brit obviously but uh you know when i like if i look for work where i'm i'm talking with people in the u.s and I just do a salary comparison to the UK and it's like half. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I mean, if I went to Cambridge or Oxford or whatever, and was like looking to actually make a career, I'd, I'd just be going to, I'd be like, I'm off to New York. Why, yeah. why would you come to London? Yeah. And also, you know, they've, they've got energy abundance. They've, they've also got land abundance. So, you know, how does the is? love actually affect? You'll, yeah. you'll immediately go up in the uh, the dating rating just with the accent. <laughs> oh, is that can't go mm -hmm. much lower. So, so you, if you talk like Hugh Grant, you have a chance. In, yeah, oh, yeah. Interesting. Have a chance. What do you mean? You <laughs> swarmed. Yeah, yeah. No, if my girlfriend is watching this, I'm not thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah, no. Uh, I just, I mean, this is. I, I think it would be it would be a really really good idea for. Like, it's the sort of thing that DeSantis has tried to do in Florida, hasn't he? Like when the when the whole sort of BLM. Um, as my one of my friends likes to call it, the year of twenty twenty, the year of a million non sequiturs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like when when BLM was was kicking off, and you know, police in incredibly in Democrat run cities, understandably, didn't feel like they had much in the way of yeah. job security mm -hmm. that, that they wouldn't really back them in their effort to kind of clamp down on cri crime in, the, in those high crime areas. DeSantis was like, "Come to Florida, we'll, we'll give you this, we'll give you that." There were all sorts of yeah. carrots. Dangles. They didn't turn anybody away. Is the thing is, if you applied, you basically got it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was the th say that again, sir. Uh, basically, if if you were a police officer from Seattle and you were just like, "I want to get the hell out of Seattle," I'm going yeah. to Florida. Yeah. It wasn't like you had to 
the compliance and there was a bunch of people that were like, oh, okay, and it great. was an instant signing on fee or something yep. like that. There yeah, were all yeah. sorts of carrots. I mean, there's no reason why. Like, it would have to be calibrated in the right way because you're right, we've had lots of immigration, but it hasn't tended to be from those high, high, yeah. those Brexit immigration has, has overwhelmingly been from less culturally compatible lower income countries rather than from more culturally compatible high income countries. Yeah, I, I really like Neil O'Brien's line on this actually, which mm. is to make uh, Britain the grammar school of the Western world mm. in terms of immigration, which I think is really great. That's People nice love idea. grammar schools, they do. Yeah. but we do need to work towards a much, much, much more selective system. And this is this is absolutely baffling. I find this completely baffling. People have voted in this country consistently since immigration rose in the mid 90s to reduce immigration. Mm -hmm. And that culminated with the Brexit vote and it was amplified with 2019. Um, and yet immigration continues to rise. Mm -hmm. You know, the points based system was very clearly a way to people considered it a way to reduce immigration. And yet yeah. immigration has gone up. Yeah, it wasn't just a constitutional uh, formality. No, in, no, in people's minds, and that's how the Conservative Party have treated it. And just people on the people on the Brexit supporting side of things generally, like the the, the, the real way, I might like in in my view, the, the real way to um, try and rumble someone who's actually not really a restrictionist, but which is merely try using the popularity of restrictionism in order to promote their Brexit uh, fantasies, is if they use the word control immigration instead of reduce immigration. Yeah. And Boris Johnson, like if you go back through all of his old speeches, almost exclusively he was refer he would only ever refer to controlling immigration, like not so much talking about what they're going to do with that control, but it w but the powers would be repatriated to um, to Westminster as opposed to being um, you know uh, in Brussels. But you don't have to look back through his speeches, right? By, oh, no, true. by your deed shall you know them. Quite <laughs> you so. Know. Quite um, so. Yes. But not, not, not three years of uh, of constant all-time high immigration. Yeah, no, of course. But this is the, one of the problems, though, is that I, I, I maybe you just actually this, this is an interesting question. I might want, I do want to ask you. I think there is a complete misunderstanding about in in the public mind about the different factions in the Conservative Party. There's this view that Boris Johnson is this sort of right wing. I, well, maybe, maybe it's because of his hair. It's because people just like think he's Trump. Think he's Trump yeah. because of his hair. But the people, not, not enough people know what a this sort of swivel-eyed liberal cosmopolitan he really was. <laughs> Yeah, they haven't really caught. I mean, he's got. He was given a show on GB News. I mean, there are all these people, creatures in the Conservative Party. Again, I, I sorry. I don't, Has he even done that show? No idea. I was I, thinking I, about. I don't know what's happening. So he did nice. this big announcement that he was going to do a yeah, show yeah. with GB, and then just like yeah. never showed up. No, it's very strange. That's because Ofcom would get a ban it. Probably they would instantly ban it. The point is, is that they, do, on the ground, do people understand that Boris Johnson is in fact not? Particularly conservative. Do they? Do, do people get that, or is there this understanding that he was? He, he was sort of, you know, cooed. Obviously, there was there was a coup. I'm not saying there wasn't, but like the, this coup was politically motivated. Like, in, like in terms of his act, actual ideology, there's very little to separate him from someone like Penny Morton. Yeah, I think I think actually, Boris's presentation was genuinely masterful. Yeah, because Boris the campaigner was a very cultural conservative immigration restrictionist. Um, I think only he could have won the 2019 election. Um, you know, even speaking about leveling up, that was that sounds really, really um, small, and it and it has devolved into basically a government bid scheme. That's that's. I'm saying this, but actually, my division's got about 60 million quid from it, so I'm not going to criticise it too much. Um, <laughs> But it's it's basically just a, a government bid system. But that was very, very clever because it spoke to people's desire for, you know, an economics of belonging, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think basically Boris's messaging still wins out over Boris's reality. And yeah. I don't know how he does it. But now we're in the situation where, you know, we are conservatives are accused of being far right, fascist, you know, two steps away from Nazis yeah. and <laughs> look at what we're doing. And then meanwhile, John Major is right. And lots of other of these kinds of like one nation Tories have written a book, which is, I tried to read some of it. It was just insufferable. I had to throw it out the window. It's, <laughs> it's called uh, the case for the center, right? As if like we oh, haven't, yeah. as if we haven't been governed by sort of center leftists for, yeah. for, for, for a good deal of time. And I, and I also, it also occurred to me that like, if, if by, by, by the standards which people like John Major invoke today in order to condemn the Conservative Party as far right, 
he in the 1990s yeah. was presiding over fourth Reich levels of immigration i mean like by his own standards yeah. because it, the immigration was completely negligible negligible in the we're talking in the early early 90s here it was in it was it was um consistent with patterns that had in the, it was in the yeah. thousands that had existed in the, in the previous decades and, but all of a sudden when immigra net immigration is running at, at about 650,000 a year grows 1.2 million yeah that's sort of dangerously far it's, right it's also like, sort of like weirdly bizarre and myopic to call anyone in the conservatives far right because if you then look to the continent and you look to the parties that are starting to take yeah. over they actually are they far 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 right <laughs> like they're off the richter scale like, yeah. like if you think this is yeah. far right have you seen what's just happened in portugal like yeah, yeah. What, what, what? I don't know. It's 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 bizarre to me, and it's it's also bizarre that you don't really see this conversation happening in the U.S. You do see a little bit of it in Canada. Um, do you, what do you mean? Which conversation? W this conversation of any sort of conservative challenge is far right, mm. um, and I, I don't know oh, how yeah. long that can last because people will simply say it, it's kind of like the word racist, which has now begun to lose almost all meaning because mm -hmm. everyone eventually was one. Mm -hmm. um, or sexist now, which is like, you can't even, you call someone that they won't even get fired at this point. Mm, yeah. It's like far right is losing all its potency. And there are actual far right people out there, um, which I, you're, you're giving them a lot of cover by calling Jake Brees Mong, you know, like a semi-fascist. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, it's just an enforcement mechanism for things the establishment doesn't like. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think it's, I think it's going to be really, really interesting because I think probably we are part of a generation of of conservatives who having grown up for the first time with the internet probably that stuff doesn't really affect us that much because it's been going on mm. since the year dot yeah, yeah and you mean we're sort of plugged into the linguistic inflation that's been going on so we don't exactly yeah, yeah. exactly and actually you know again you look at the last 14 years of near consecutive all-time high immigration figures <laughs> is that the actions of a racist? Yeah, yeah. You know, there is this disconnect between between what we're accused of and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I basically think that these things will, will just eventually get to a stage where they are washing off washing off politicians' backs. Mm. And I think I think that's that was one of Trump's superpowers was that Trump did not care what people who were not going to vote for him mm. thought of him. And I think you see that with somebody like uh, Bukele in, in El, El, Sal El Salvador. El Salvador. Yeah, yeah. He does not care yeah, yeah. what people who do not are, who are not going to vote. To for be him fair, in the, in the case of Bukele, I think he has um, only like five percent of the population is not voting for him at well, this exactly. point. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. But, no, but but this is the but, thing though. A lot of those people, like he, is very very much criticised in the media. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And I think the media is is overrepresented with Bukele critics, mm -hmm. and he just doesn't care. Mm. And and people will accept this. The Conservative Party used to have a reputation of uh, cruel but competent, mm -hmm. and now we are cruel and incompetent. Exactly. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't help. The, 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 the other thing with Trump, the one of his, um, you actually got absolutely right to call it a, a superpower. Um, the other thing with Trump is that um, he had basically kind of two options. When, like whenever he, as you mainstream media journalists would try to catch him out. He either weaponized the language that he or she was using against that person. And so the, that, there will be other cases, but the one that I can think of off the top of my head was when he was once asked, like put under lots of pressure to kind of come out in terms of what he thought about uh, the, what, do you want to, do you want Ukraine to win and um, and do you want do you want do you want regime change in Russia and he said I want the fighting to stop and I want regime change in Washington like that's good and then and, but, and then or he would make a joke and the famous one here is of course where he was like all of these completely indefensible comments he'd made about women over the years and then the famous like only Rosie O'Donnell like, only, only Rosie O'Donnell Mr Trump you've called women <laughs> disgusting fat yeah. pigs no 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 <laughs> only Rosie O'Donnell only that one woman I think that like one of exactly. the election. They could almost. I actually won quite a lot of money on Trump. Did you? Yeah. yeah. In the first debate with Hillary. Oh yeah. I I had I had watched the Republican debates and I watched the way he destroyed low energy Jeb. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought this guy might not flame out. Yeah. This guy might last the course. And in the debate with Hillary, where Hillary said, um, 
Yeah. I think it's a great thing that somebody like Donald Trump is not in charge someone of our league. Someone with the temperament of Donald <laughs> Trump. Trump is not you'd in charge in of our jail league. system. <laughs> because you'd be in jail. I thought, he, yeah. he's going to do this. But it was because he doesn't, he doesn't was, care. Was, and that's the politics of, like, in Machiavellian terms, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. the politics of the lion. Yeah, yeah. Frightening yeah. off the yeah. walls. Yeah, yeah. And people love that. Yeah, they do. And this is, But I just don't understand why the Conservative... I can't, I, I, the Conservative doesn't seem to understand this formula, that if you put... If you if you put before the country a perfectly legitimate, humane, um, sort of culturally conservative, socially conservative, demographically conservative uh, like agenda for five years, ten years, but for the next five years, the next ten years even, like, it would be overwhelmingly popular. And Emily Maitlis, you just all you need to do when she comes knocking is just dig your heels in, and you will be liked for it. You will be loved for mm. it. I uh, I wonder how much of this is is deliberate and how much of this is about governing strategy. I I talk quite a lot about governing strategy in the things I write because I think it's really really important and I think part of our problem I think the the thing rotten in the state of Denmark is that we have failed to overturn the Blairite governing strategy and I think that's our original sin mm -hmm. because we have outsourced greater and greater amounts of money and power out of the hands of democratically elected, democratically accountable ministers mm -hmm. into quangos, into the hands of civil servants. And I think the, the basically the removal of that, that, that power and the decentralization of, of um, political authority and policy making, things like that. I think that's part of the reason that actually we, we can't seem to do yeah. that much conservative yeah. stuff because we can't get it through the quangos. Indeed, but that's the, so that would be excuse, like, so I, I agree with you. I think that's absolutely true. There's been a failure to, there's been, there's been a resignation about like we're trying to work within the Blairite paradigm rather than, um, you know, trying to remake it or to replace it or dismantle it or like however you drain want. Drain the swamp, drain destroy the, swamp, the blob. Drain the swamp, destroy the blob, <laughs> however you want to put it. Uh, but, um, that would be excusable if they'd be, not excusable. But that would be l more less con contemptible if they had, um, if the Conservative Party had, had nevertheless not, like, sort of uh, doubled down on the Blairite Revolution. Yeah. It's one thing to work. Yeah. It's one thing. So it's, one, yeah. it's one thing to work within the Blairite paradigm. It's another thing to fortify it and then make sure it's even more heavily entrenched. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we're seeing with this new extremism definition yep. from Michael Gove. Uh, the mass immigration going even 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 further up. Um, you know, the online safety bill, sort of making the, the kind of powers which are invested in Ofcom, all of a sudden making them actionable, not only on terrestrial television, but on the internet and other yep. places as well. Like, I, what, that, that's what I find very confusing. Yeah, and I think, I think actually the, the big society has oh, okay. a lot to blame for this. So you might not remember this. No. It might be before your time. When we won the election in 2010, um, David Cameron, um, who I don't know if you know that he used to be prime minister. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> he he came up with this idea of the big society, yeah. and it was to be paired alongside austerity. And basically, the plan was to bring in civil society into government and into the delivery of of government services as insofar as possible, mm. because government could not sustain the level of welfare that it was providing um but also because it was better for community cohesion and things like that mm. which which actually to be fair is true yeah. um but the problem is that what everybody always forgets is that edmund burke is always right and it's the little platoons that we belong to not the big one and we were doing all these things essentially through devolution from the state and they were allowing in astroturfed um, civil society groups and campaigning charities, um, you know, this is what Pop Coburn calls the radical sheep charities, mm. um, basically it allowed them far, far more money and power than they had before. So we, you're right, we've doubled down, we've exacerbated the problem much to a far worse extent. You know, we are now giving money to charities. We've spent more on charities that have fought the Rwanda bill in court than we have on the Rwanda scheme, which is 
I mean, it, it's crackers. Yes. Because not only is that bad governing strategy, it has taxpayers' money. Yeah, Did you see and it? it's like, it's, you know, a hundred million pounds we've spent it's on this st- debacle. Yeah, has st- anyone even been sent to Rwanda yet? No. I keep like waiting for like news. No, like, we just keep sending Paul Kagame like a 747 <laughs> full of cash <laughs> instead of, <laughs> instead of rapists. I mean, I saw, I saw, I saw a headline and it was like, we're going to start paying a failed asylum seekers to leave the country. I was like, why don't you pay the police to like extradite them from the country? Like, what is this? This is, this is another thing that occurred to me when I was reading through Michael Gove's uh, strategy for, like, so one of the, uh, for defining extremism. So there are all sorts of really infuriatingly vague t- uh, concepts invoked in order to sort of try and nail down what extremism is. But one of the most vaguest of all is like, anything which undermines the fundamental rights of other people will be classed as extremist. So if you want to campaign against the European Convention on Human Rights, which I mean, I would I would want us to withdraw from that at this point. I would and I would certainly want to repeal the Human Rights Act, which kind of enshrined it in in UK law at a, at a, in a very important way in I think ninety seven or ninety eight. Like, surely by any by reason by any reasonable definition, like I I, would, I don't actually regard those as fundamental. That, well, I don't regard the way the way in which that is applied is actually yeah. impinging on people's fundamental rights. But nevertheless, someone could very easily class me or you or Evan mm. or whoever it might be as a person who does want to repeal people's fundamental rights purely on account of the fact that they want to try and correct a, a very kind of um, a- arcane and antiquated um, sort of hangover in British law, which is doing us serious damage. Yeah. Like, you know. Can I ask what might be a, a somewhat stupid question, which is that, okay, so anything that in- sort of impinges upon your fundamental human rights, which I'm assuming are British human rights. So it's, it, if you, I mean, obviously there are countries and people coming from these countries that don't have the same rights that the native Englanders do here. So would it not be then stated that basically every other government that doesn't follow kind of Westminster standards is extremist? Yeah, no, it would, yeah. It would have to, it would have to. And so that would, I mean, if they were going to be consistent, that would have to have an impact implications in our foreign policy, as well as implications in our domestic law. But the point is, is that the, the concern, I, I mean, we, which we obviously we got it. It's what we started with, but um, at the beginning of at the top of the show. But it it it. Um, I, I suppose that we are running short of time. I wonder if this might be the last question I c- I could ask you. Do you think that there's any? Maybe this is too loaded. Uh, do, do, you think, do you think there's any? I know what's coming. Do you think there's any potential spite in what Gove is the way in which Gove is defining extremism? Because I, the conservatives, uh, the upper echelon, in the upper echelons of the party, must know at this point that they are in serious trouble. It's very likely that after the next election, Gove will never, ever hold any kind of ministerial office ever again. Is, do you think part of this is a bit of a, a bit of a two fingers on the way out? Spite to whom? So to people like us who feel infuriated and underserved and who, and whom Gove must know at this point are not going to be brought around into giving them another five years. I mean, I mean, anything's possible. Sure. I, I, I don't think so. Um, That's how I felt. Yeah, really I could imagine. Yeah, it felt personal. <laughs> it felt personal. Yeah, um, I don't think so. I, I, I think it's. I don't think this is a break from what we've been doing before. Like, I don't think this marks a new chapter of sticking two fingers up at somebody. I think this is what we've been doing consistently since we've been we've in government. We've been in government, which is <laughs> making it quite difficult to make conservative arguments and do conservative things. Mm. And I think it's just an extension, extension of the way we've governed, basically, which is in not a particularly right wing way. <laughs> it might be spite, mm. but My so it's not malice; it. it's incompetence. <laughs> yeah, usually, mm. usually. the, the cock-up theory of history. Well, yeah. listen, Tom, thank you so much for coming on the program. It's been a real pleasure. Evan, thanks as ever. You've been watching Deprogrammed. Make sure to like, subscribe, leave a comment if you wish, and we shall see you on the next one.